Isn't that a great story? Hey, welcome. Good morning. So glad that you are here. If you're brand new exploring spiritual things or if you're a long timer or something in between, I'm, I'm just really glad that you're here. So turn in your Bibles and we're going to go to Luke chapter 12. That's in the New Testament. And if you didn't bring a Bible, you don't need to feel awkward about it. You can borrow one. The ushers are going to come in both rooms right now and they're passing them out. You're welcome to borrow one and keep it if you need. It's our gift to, to you. Uh, so we'll go to Luke 12 in just a few moments. So today we're returning uh, after the Super Bowl party last week to a series that we started at the turn of the new year that we're calling uh, Remedies to the Seven Deadly Sins. And so let's just remember where we were when we left off. We were saying that uh, years ago, Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly effective people. Well, in this series, I guess you could say we've been talking, spiritually speaking, about the seven habits of highly destructive and destructing people. Uh, but if you're new, I would want you to know this. The goal here at Faithbridge for us is never to lay on guilt trips or to whip people into shame or self-despair. That's not what we're trying to do. No, no, no. The reason that we do series like this and take a look at seven deadly sins, for example, is to try to figure out how has the devil been working for thousands of years to kill and steal and destroy people's lives so that we can get out in front of it and anticipate it and be equipped and fortified to withstand those temptations to the end that we might enjoy a flourishing life, a thriving life, working the way that God always had in mind for our lives to work. So today we come to the sin of greed, which probably comes as a relief to most of you because you're thinking right now, whew, finally one that I don't struggle so much with. Now, that guy over there, <laughs> I'm really glad he's here. And she, she definitely needs it. Oh yeah, we can spot the people who need it, but, but when it comes to greed, most of us tend to think, I don't need this one. <laughs> Moi? Nah. Because one study I came across said, greed is the sin that people most readily spot in others while least frequently spotting in themselves. Most of us don't feel greedy, do we? But I'm going to challenge you for just a few moments to go through some of the, I don't know, the probing or the introspection that I've had to go through this week as I've been studying for this message. Let me just ask you a question. Have you ever salivated about maybe acquiring something new? Like maybe a new house or maybe new appliances for your old house or maybe a new car or maybe even new iPhone? Have you ever thought to yourself, I really want that. But once I have that, then I'll be happy forever. You ever done that? Of course you have. All of us have those sorts of thoughts along the way. Now, let me anticipate what some of you are thinking right here, especially if you just came for the first time last week. You're like, wait a second. I see what you, you baited me. You got me here for a Super Bowl party and gave me caramel covered popcorn. And then you bring me back in and tell me that I'm going to be greedy and have probably solutions that I'm supposed to give back to your church. And that'll make it all go away, right? I see what's going on here. And if you had that cynicism, I would understand it because there is always a potential conflict of interest when a minister talks about financial things, about money and stuff, because ministers are in charge of charitable organizations, and charitable organizations do depend upon the benevolent giving of their people in order to survive. And so this very reason right here, along with the reality that as you just saw in the video, any of us know who've been here in the fall, we just came through a big mammoth campaign, and it was over overwhelmingly, unprecedentedly successful uh, in order to move forward and build the legacy building for our youth and, and missions and, and our chapel and the parking lot uh, to, to give us more uh, spaces, which they've already started on, even though to, today the, we're finally getting out front and doing the groundbreaking ceremony in uh, uh, about 45 minutes. So I hope that you can stay for that. But for all of those reasons, I found myself saying, oh, Lord, could we just skip this one? I really don't want to talk about money again. 
and greed and stuff. How about a series called The Six Deadly Sins? <laughs> that has a nice ring to it. But the Lord showed me something in my own heart, which I'll share later, that convinced me none of us ever really masters this thing called greed, not once and for all. And this is why Jesus talked so regularly about it in so many places throughout the New Testament, but certainly never clearer than in Luke chapter 12. So one day, the context, he was teaching his disciples, and other people gathered around, and they're listening as well. And he's been preaching to them, teaching to them about the Holy Spirit. He wasn't saying anything about money, about possessions, about stuff. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. And then this man in the crowd just blurts out, just interrupts him out of the blue. Something entirely unexpected. Let's look at what he said in verse 13, chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? He said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I'll store my supply of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Now take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. And then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up for themselves treasures, but isn't rich towards God. Sobering words. Why did that man interrupt Jesus in the first place? Why did he change the subject and just interrupt the whole sermon? Well, I'll tell you, because in those days, rabbis were often used as arbiters, sort of like judges today. So perhaps here was a younger fella who couldn't concentrate on Jesus' sermon anyhow because he was miffed that his older brother wasn't dispensing their inheritance to his liking. So he just blurts out and says to Jesus, you be the arbitrator, to which Jesus says, yeah, that ain't going to be happening. But... I will tell you this, young man, you better watch out because greed is crouching at your door. You can't see it, but I can look into your heart and I can see it. Your problem is needing more than an arbiter. You got a greed problem. You better watch out, which leads to the first of three observations that I would like us to draw from this text today. And so if you're a note taker, here's the first one. Greed consistently escapes our self-awareness. Greed consistently escapes our self-awareness. People regularly say to each other in confessional groups or prayer groups or even say to pastors, oh, I'm wrestling with lust, or I'm wrestling with envy, or I'm wrestling with anger, would you pray for me? But whoever said I wrestle with greed... Nobody, ever. What people say instead is, well, you know, in this season, we're just trying to be very careful. Or, you know, it's important to save for the future. And both of these things are good and true and even biblical. Proverbs 21, among other passages, confirms this. So, yes, it is a good thing to plan. It is a good thing to be responsible but there's a lot of greed that can hide behind those words, you know? Because see, greed, <laughs> it's a slippery thing. There's never one clear-cut behavior which when you commit it, that was it. You just got greedy. You just became, see the line, it's so fuzzy. Not so with other sins. Take murder, for example. That's pretty clear. 
No confusion about it. Or what about adultery? Yep, the same. What about stealing? Yep, that doesn't belong. Yeah, you took that. Guilty. See, there's a very clear line in so many of the sins, but not with greed. And that's why it's so slippery and so evasive from us. Because we can't find the line. Greed's also hard for us to spot because it knows no socioeconomic boundaries. There's greedy rich people and there's greedy poor people. The rich fool in this story could have been 10 times richer and entirely acceptable in the kingdom of God. Or he could have been 100 times poorer and been just as damned. Because greed has nothing to do with the amount, but everything to do with the heart. And that's why Jesus said, you better watch out. This one is sneaking up on you, and you don't see it. There's one other reason we don't spot it too easily. Because it doesn't just only show up in the finances of life. Now, see, we can be greedy with our time. For example, should I take more from my sibling who's voluntary terribly caring for our aging parent, or should I take a week off from work and fly in and, and give them some relief? We can be greedy about our reputation. For example, should I accept everybody's praise and encouragement, or should I give some credit to the rest of the people who I know very well did so much of the work? And don't we know greed is present in the world of sports as well. We who are Houston Astros fan are particularly aware of this in this era. What was happening? Greed. If we could just get the slightest advantage on those pitchers, then eventually we'd finally get that championship. Now I know some of you right now, you're saying, don't pick on our Astros <laughs> because other teams are doing it as well in different ways. They just haven't gotten caught. And that's probably true, which just proves the point that Jesus was making all the more. It's always easy to spot greed in other people, and it's terribly hard for us to spot it in ourselves because we're really good at rationalizing this thing called greed. Which is why in verse 15, Jesus said, watch out. This one sneaks up on you. And then to illustrate the point, he tells this parable, this story that he's making up about the rich man in verses 16 and following. Which leads to the second observation that I want us to notice today. It's this. Greed always whispers. You deserve this. You deserve this. Look, the man said, <laughs> I'm getting blessed out the ears. So many crops. What am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns and I'll say to myself, <laughs> look at there. You got plenty of grain laid up for many years. So eat, drink, and be merry. Self, you deserve this. We saw several weeks ago when we talked about envy that envy says God owes me this. And then in anger we found out anger says you owe me this. Greed says I owe me this. It's never too hard, is it, for us to come up with a little plan for what we should do with the extra, is it? We'll build bigger barns. That's what we'll do. Get a bigger barn, get a bigger house, get a bigger car, get a bigger storage unit. I mean, we got to do something with it, all right? And then we'll surely be set forever, right? 
never. In one of his books, Andy Stanley calls this mindset BBS. It's called Bigger Barn Syndrome. (laughs) And it's prevalent. BBS, the malady common to any of us whose hearts are infected with greed. And that would be about all of us, for it magnifies the assumption that if it's placed in my hands, it must be for me. If it's in my checking account, it must be for me. If it came in my paycheck, it must be for me. If it goes in my 401k, then it must be for me. If it's part of my inheritance, that's for me too. If I won the lottery, that would definitely be for me because what are the odds of that? I mean, that's a sure sign of God's blessing, right? See, greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. Crazy assumption, it's all for my consumption. Either I'll consume it now through spending or I'll stash it up and store it and hoard it and I'll consume it later. But either way, greed's the assumption. It's all for my consumption. It's mine. And I deserve it. So last summer, I uh, served as the speaker for one of the weeks at Pine Cove Family Camp, where Suzanne and I have been invited a number of times, taking our family. It's a marvelous family camp program. If you've never gone or if you'd like an activity for your family, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's wonderful, uh, the program that Pine Cove does. Um, Well, one evening during the summer camp last summer, uh, they served us dessert, and they spent an hour showing us slides and pictures of an expansion project that they're going to be working on uh, at the camp. And they're going to expand the cafeteria and build a new kitchen because they're having so many more people coming, and they need to build some more cabins for the families to be accommodated. And, and I thought, what do you know? They're doing an expansion project at the same season. We're getting ready to do an expansion project here at Faith Bridge with Legacy this fall. Small world. So, like everybody else, at the end of the presentation, I took one of the pledge cards, mostly to be polite, because all the while I knew, well, the Whirlines are going all in for legacy. I mean, I got a lead by example, speed of the leader, speed of the team. So, Susan and I are already praying about what are we going to do? What are we? Gonna, how can we be the most generous ever for legacy? And on and on. But I kept the pledge card and threw it somewhere, and it ended up in a drawer in my desk where I put the bills that haven't yet been paid. You have a drawer like that too, huh? And (laughs) a couple of times as I went through that drawer through the fall, I came upon that card and I I would look at it and I'd say to myself, huh, well, after legacy uh, and all, I'll have to get back to this one of these days when I get a little extra money. But right now, I got to lead by example. We're going in big for legacy. And like many of you, Last fall, we did go in big, made the biggest commitment we'd ever made in our married lives, and we're thrilled about it, so excited about the youth ministry and the chapel and about the missions and all that happens. Well, we get through Legacy and, of course, hit the goal and soared past the goal, and there was much celebration and still is, and we're celebrating a little while at the groundbreaking. Uh, And then December rolls around. I think it was the first week of December. I was sitting up there in 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 a meeting one day, and I get an email that comes across my screen uh, from Pine Cove. I figure, well, it's probably them asking for money for the campaign. You know how those nonprofits are. They're always asking for your money. <laughs> but I opened the email, and that's not what it said. The email said, we're having a, a family camp the week after Christmas, in four weeks. And we call it a New Year's conference. And could you be the speaker for it? I figured, wow, somebody must have canceled last minute because they always book a year, two years out when they're going to book you in to speak. But it's quick, and so I called Suzanne. I said, hey, we got an opportunity. Should we go? And she's like, yeah, that'd be kind of a fun way to spend the slow days after Christmas. So I emailed back and said, yeah, go count the war lines in. Sign us up. We'll be there. And thanks. I'm flattered to be asked. Well, as things uh, progressed through December, our ninth grader, Wesley, who's a Boy Scout, he said, you know, Dad, I just really feel like I really need to go to the winter camp because I want to earn the merit badges and keep doing that. I said, that's fine, you go into winter camp. And then, as things would transpire over Christmas, Suzanne caught that awful, croupy, coffee, 
thing that was going around so much at Christmas time. And, and, and I remember Christmas night, she said, I just don't think I can go to the camp. I, I think I just need to rest and get well for the new year. And I said, baby, I think you do. But that's okay. Susie, uh, uh, William, my sixth grader, William and I, we'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll just have a good father-son time. And so it'll be great. And it was great. We went together and we participated in all the activities that they offered. And, and in our spare time, and our free time, we shot baskets and threw footballs till my shoulder was sore. And then on New Year's Eve, they, we went with all the other families and watched the, the, uh, the fireworks be shot over the lake uh, there at Pine Cove. And it, it was just wonderful. And at nighttime in our cabin, when we'd be getting ready for bed, William and I had some really good conversations. Came home and told Susie, and I think it might have been one of the best blocks of time I've ever had with our William. It was just great. And uh, the last day, they always get everybody up on the front porch of the big building, the, the, the main building, and they take a big group photo and everybody hugs and, and says goodbye to our new friends. And, and then we get in our cars and drive away. And just as I was getting into our car to, to drive away, a lady from uh, Pine Cove walks up and hands me an envelope got in the car and we drove away. As we're driving, William and I are reminiscing, talking about what fun it was and how great it was and all the things we'd experienced and on and on. And then finally, out of nowhere, he, he says to me, by the way, what's in the envelope that they gave you? I said, oh, well, uh, that's my paycheck. He said, wait, you got paid <laughs> for that? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, son. I was the, the, the speaker for the week, and you know, uh, I'm worth it. <laughs> and he said, really? How much did they pay you? I said, well, they paid me $1,500. To which he threw his head back, looks out the window on his side of the car, <laughs> didn't they know? What, son? Didn't they know? You would have done that one just for the fun of it, for free. (laughs) And that irritated me. (laughs) I spotted a McDonald's and say, here, have a Big Mac. (laughs) Well, it's time to get back home and unpack. And the next day I was sitting up in my study, uh, paying bills and getting everything fixed from all our expenses from Christmas and I came upon that pledge card, and I started to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to get back to that. It's a great program they have there. When they get a little extra money, I'll get back to that. Have you ever felt like the Lord just snuck up (laughs) on your backside unexpected? And I resisted. Part of me was like, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. I see what you're doing here. Uh Uh-uh. See... I gave my whole fall. I went apart from the family night after night to do those legacy meetings. We sacrificed, and we made the biggest pledge we've ever made, and we don't regret it one bit. We're excited, but this one, God, this one is for me. I know that's what you want because it'll pay off all the Christmas uh, gifts, and it, it, it just that's it, God, right? And I sensed him say to me, What good thing have you that hasn't been given to you? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. I was resistant still. And he brought to my mind a variety of happy memories that we've made over the years at Pine Cove. And then the thought crossed my mind. You know, their expansion project is just as important to their future as Faithbridge's expansion project is important to Faithbridge's future. And I knew he had me at that. Checkmate. I surrendered, chuckled, picked up my pen, filled out the pledge card, put it in the envelope with a fresh check for $1,500. And a note at the bottom, the Whirlines are excited about your expansion project. Thanks for all you've done over the years for our family as well as many. 
Now, I tell you that story. That embarrassing story. Which is part of the reason that I'm really looking forward to when this series is over. Because I'm tired of having to tell all these embarrassing stories when you talk about the seven dozen sins. God says, well, you better illustrate. And I just am tired of it. But I tell it to you simply to illustrate this. You don't ever throw off the greed monster. None of us does. Not once and for all. Just when you think you drove him back and drove him out, he comes slithering back in. It's insidious how that happens. So what have we said? We said greed is hard to spot. It's hard to spot in ourselves. And it tempts us to say, you deserve this. This one belongs to you. And one more thing. Greed causes us to overlook the most obvious of realities. You know what that is. You can't save yourself. None of us can save ourselves. Oh, greed tries. It tries to hurl an endless list towards us of what ifs. But the longer I live, the more I realize (laughs) none of us could ever accumulate enough to give us the assurance of readiness for every conceivable eventuality. That's not possible. And even if you think you got there, just wait till tomorrow and you'll think of something else that could go wrong and what you gotta anticipate. Just this past week, I heard, as did most of you, about a well-known radio personality who was diagnosed with advanced stage lung cancer. And one article that I read about him said he is worth a half billion dollars. And then on Tuesday night, he was even given a very prestigious medal around his neck. And as I watched that clip, knowing what I was preaching on, I couldn't help but think, can any of those achievements, can any of that which has been saved give him the ultimate safety and security that our souls long for? No, because none of us can save ourselves. And there is a day that is coming for all of us which will prove to be your last, your last, my last. We don't like to talk about that much. And it's particularly difficult because we don't know when that day will be, which makes us feel horribly out of control that only he knows when that day will be. And therefore, it feels a bit scary to us. And that, friends, foundationally, is the very reason that we become like the rich fools, so inclined to cling on to everything with white knuckles, stashing it away in the biggest barns we can find, because we're afraid. And we figure, maybe, just maybe, I can soften the blow. We're fooling ourselves into thinking we can save ourselves, but we know better. You know better. Go back to the gospel. What's the gospel? What's the good news of our faith? It's that our great God who knew that none of us could ever ultimately save ourselves said, trust me, I can save you, and I will. And he came close to us. As Philippians 2 says, making himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, he appeared as a man, Jesus, so that we could see him with our own eyes and so that we could hear him with our own ears as he says to us, put your trust in me. Your stuff can't save you but I can because I'm the only real savior. 
And I'm telling you, if we could just keep hold of that perspective all the time, we would start to look upon our stuff a lot less like the fool in Luke chapter 12 and a lot more like a different man in Luke chapter 19. Do you remember that man? His name was Zacchaeus. Remember, he was the wee little man. He was a tax collector. And the Bible tells us that when the parade was coming down uh, the street and there was Jesus, he climbed up into the sycamore tree so that he could catch a sight of Jesus. Which begs the question, why did he climb the tree? I'll tell you this, it wasn't because he was short. Any of us who are tall, no, it wasn't because he was short. Because tall people will always let the short people cut in front of them for a parade because you can still see just fine. No, the reason that he had to climb up in the tree is because he was despised and rejected by his peers and they weren't going to let him come near to see. So he knew he was by himself and he climbed up the tree taking steps to catch a glimpse on his own. And then, wonder of wonders, Jesus stops the parade and looks up spotting Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down from that tree because I want you to experience my forgiveness and my grace and my love. I know you're a tax collector. I know you've been skimming off the top. I know you've been stealing from others for years. And I know that's the reason you're up in that tree because they hate you. But I don't. I love you. Jesus was in essence saying, you come down from that tree. I'd like to make a trade with you, Zacchaeus. You come down from that tree and I'll forgive you and I'll give you grace like you've never experienced before from all your greed, from all your selfishness, from all your duplicity. And in return, I'll make a trade. Eventually, I'll go up in a tree and though I've never sinned, I'll take your punishment for you. I'll step in for you. And that's the gospel. That's the good news that Jesus would come and live the life of sinlessness that none of us could live in order that he could die the death of punishment as our substitute, the death that all of us deserved to the end that on the third day he might conquer the grave that we could never conquer. That's the gospel. And I'm telling you, when Zacchaeus met that Jesus, his heart was so amazed by grace, by forgiveness, that something changed. Oh, really, everything changed. Look at what he says, Zacchaeus, in Luke 19. When you read it on your own, he comes out of that house and he announces to Jesus and to all who might hear, after today, I'm going to go and I'm going to make restitution to every person I ever stole from. I'm going to make it right. And hereafter, I'm going to give 50% of my stuff away. Why was he doing that? Was he doing that so that Jesus would say, okay, now you're fit for salvation. Now I'll save you. That's probably good enough. You're in. No. He did that because Jesus first said, I love you and I do forgive you. And when you experience that sort of grace, friends, it changes everything. So it's been a little bit more than five years now since I had a brush with grace, the likes of which I had never before experienced. If you're new here, you may not have heard this story. I usually try to tell it about once or twice a year. But a little more than five years ago, on January 15th, 2015, through a string of unexpected, unprecedented, providential serendipities, a day that started out normal ended with me in the medical center looking eye to eye with a cardiologist named Stuart Solomon who shook his head and said earnestly, Mr. Worley, I'm terribly sorry to tell you this, but your body is actively trying to go into coronary arrest right now. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I believe it's going to be in the next several hours. 
I said, well, what do we do? He says, I need to get you to the hospital. I need to have you in the cath lab immediately. He said, you call your wife, and then I'm going to drive you. I said, you're going to drive me? He said, yeah, I've already calculated. If I put you in an ambulance, it'll take way too long. I need to be inside your system in the next 30 minutes. And sure enough, he took me by the hand and walked down the hallway with me, carrying my book back. We rode down the elevator, and he put me into his Lexus, and he drove me down the street and parked and put me in a wheelchair and pushed me over where I rode up to the 10th floor of Methodist. And he hollered to the nurses, come over here and take him and get him, or I need him in the cath lab immediately. And a couple of hours later, he leaned over me, and he said, Mr. Werlein, I got there first. And it's a good thing I did, because your LAD artery was 99.9% blocked. You were going to check out tonight. It was going to make a widow, your widow maker was, of your wife tonight. But your arteries were so friendly, and it took the stint just perfectly, and they're printing out a picture for you so that you can see the before and the after, and you're going to be fine now. And I'm telling you, that whole night, I could hardly contain myself. I was so overwhelmed by all that God had done for me and how he had used Dr. Solomon as his servant of grace and generosity to me that night. And I was just giddy, and I couldn't hardly even sleep. And the next morning, he came in to check on me in the hospital, and I'm telling you, I, I, couldn't, I could hardly stand it. I teared up, and, and I just said... I gotta say thank you. <coughs> you saved my life. And he said, that's what we do. That's my job. I said, yeah, but I'm kind of special. I mean, this is a moment right here, you know. I'm and I'm telling you, I went home from that hospital, and I went on every website that you could find that had him, and I ranked him with five stars plus and on and on. And I said, you need to go to Stuart Solomon. He's the best doctor in the world. He'll save your life. He even drove me there in his car. I'm telling you, this is nothing. I've never seen anything like it. And to this day, I always say, if Stuart Solomon ever called me, which I don't think he ever would, and say to me, I need something from you, I don't care if it was money or a ride or I would be there in a heartbeat. Why? Because the one who's experienced much grace can't help but give much grace. That's what changes the heart, friends. Not our muscles, not our gutting it up and saying, I'm going to not be Greedy, no. It's by looking at the grace we've been shown. Years before Dr. Solomon was used to save my physical life, Jesus came into my personal life, my spiritual life. And he said, I have amazing grace for you. And that was a transformational day, and I've never been the same since, and I'm telling you, neither will you be. If you'll really turn your heart over to him and look, it upon, look upon the grace and the goodness and the favor and the love and the generosity and the forgiveness, the grace that he's shown to you, you won't be able to constrain yourself either from being generous and saying to people who have needs and causes that are in want here, <laughs> in light of all that God's done for me, I can't do it any less. You need this more than I do. You take it. And as you do, you'll have the quiet confidence that you overcame the deadly sin of greed one more time. Let's pray. Lord, won't you give us that grace to remember what you have done for us, the changes that you bring to a life the way that you melt a heart by your goodness and your faithfulness. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking that somehow we could trade in your goodness for the goodness of our stuff and our possessions as if those could ever really provide ultimately for us because they can't, and deep down we know they can't. Lord, my prayer is today that anyone who is here who's not said yes to Jesus in the first place, that they would start there. 
And they would open their hearts even in the quietness of this moment and say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking that you would come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Change me. Transform me. And put new purpose in life before me. That I might learn to live for your glory all of my days. And if you're here and you've trusted in Christ, which is, I think, most of you, my prayer for you is that even this week, you would ponder the things we've talked about. And as you step into the week that you'll say, I needed to remember that. I do know that I do believe that Jesus is better and that you'll keep our eyes fixed and focused on you. In the highs, in the lows, in the certainties, and in the unexpecteds. For we pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.